Hey everyone, welcome to Farm Nerd. There have been a couple of news stories this last week that I wanted to talk to you about. First, there was a report of a couple of research articles that looked at two shortened treatments for tuberculosis. Now, usually our tuberculosis treatment is six months of therapy with up to four drugs. Those drugs are rifampin, isoniazin, pyrazinamide, and dethambutol. So in addition to looking at better treatments for resistant strains, one of our research targets is to look at either simpler or shorter treatment duration for our standard um, strains out there. Two SIR reports published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at treatment for four months instead of the six months regimen. The first study substituted gatafloxacin for the ethambutol in the standard treatment and shortened the length of therapy to four months. The second study replaced isoniazid with moxifloxacin and also looked at a four month length of therapy. In both studies, the standard six-month regimen outperformed the shorter regimens. So while the research is interesting and certainly we need to be looking at these kinds of things, it looks like for now we're stuck with six months of therapy for TB. The second report I wanted to talk about looked at rifaximin for diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome. IBSD is one of those conditions without a whole lot of treatment options. What the study found was that about 42% of patients responded to a two-week regimen of rifaximin. They also found that even though some of those patients relapsed over the 22-week follow-up period, a second course of rifaximin also worked in about 33% of those relapsed patients. In addition, a third treatment course also worked for patients who relapsed a second time. This shows us that rifaximin may be a good therapy for some IBSD patients, and in those patients that it works, it may be worth trying more than one time. Now this study was presented in abstract form in an American College of Gastroenterology meeting, so it's something that we really need to reserve final judgment on until it's published in a peer-reviewed journal. Next, an FDA advisory panel recommended unanimously for the approval of a new treatment for psoriasis. The new drug, secukinumab, is a monoclonal antibody that targets interleukin-17 and blocks its inflammatory activity. The proposed dose is 300 milligrams given to all patients, first once weekly for one month, and then monthly thereafter. The advisory panel did recommend that post-marketing research look at a 450 milligram dose for those patients who are 90 kilograms and over. In the phase three trials for this drug, it was studied as a powder for reconstitution, a pre-filled syringe, and an auto-injector, but it's not really clear which ones of these is going to come to market right now. Now, this was only an advisory panel's recommendation, and while the FDA is not obligated to follow the recommendation of their panels, they usually do. Next, another report in the Journal of American Medical Association looked at supplements that had been recalled due to containing banned substances in the last few years. The report found that 67% of 27 studied supplement that had been forced recalled by the FDA still contained one or more banned substances. 63% of the time it was the substance that sparked the original recall and these ingredients were still in those supplements. In some of the other cases, there was a different banned substance than that was originally recalled, but still something that the FDA has prohibited use. The problem was more common in sports supplements and weight loss supplements. This really does make one wonder how these supplements were able to return to market after their recall while they still contained these banned ingredients and what the reasoning was that they were able to get around this regulation. Finally, there have been several articles published in the mainstream media addressing chocolate and memory. Most of these articles claim that eating more chocolate can improve the negative effects that aging has on a person's memory. Now, this seems like a really interesting finding, but it's a complex enough topic that I pulled the original article, and I'm hoping to devote a full video on the topic later this week. I hope this is informative for you. If you have any questions about the topics or articles discussed in this video today, please leave those down in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. Also, I'm finalizing the first video in a series about reading medical literature and interpreting the statistics you find there and I hope to have that video available soon. Thanks for spending time with me, and I'll see you next time. Mmm, I can't believe the word statistics.